With no further ado, I have a special guest speaker here this morning, and uh, I just want to preface by saying I happen to live with this guest speaker, and uh, so I've got some inside information on what she's going to share this morning, but I believe in my heart that what she's got to say, there's a word in season here, and there's, there, this is a timely message for us, so I want to encourage you, open your heart, open your spirit, uh, and receive and listen to what uh, Jackie's got laid on her heart. I do believe it's from God. Amen? Let's give her a hand as she comes up. Good morning, church. Um, Funny thing, just hearing Al get up before and share um, during worship, because I thought, how many of you were honest? Don't don't necessarily put your hand up or say what it was, but how many of you were honest? You've got struggle, or you've got, you need breakthrough, or you've got stuff going on. If you weren't, or if you're one of the blessed ones, and you're just living the dream right now, and life is as cruisy as, pray for us. Um, but if, if that's you, you've only got to look outside the door here to see that our community is struggling. Beyond that, you know what? Our nation is struggling. Beyond that, people, our beautiful world is struggling. It needs a Messiah. Is that right? You know, I had a... Um, Alan and I were watching telly a few months ago and um, he had a little situation. You know how he does this glasses on, glasses off? <laughs> it drives me batty. Can I, just, can I just tell you, it drives me batty. I'm like, just eat the humble pie, buddy. Put them on and life will look different. So we put them on while we were watching telly. I've got them and this is what happened. The, the, what do you call this? The arm, the arm fell off. And he was getting so frustrated because as you can see, it's a bit wonky. And because and I'm nagging and put them on, put them on, just leave them on. Why do you keep taking them on? I find that so distracting at church when you do that, you know, as all good wives do. And so he had a little situation where the arm broke and it started to distort his view. So, like all good wives, we nag them to go to the optometrist and to get that situation sorted. And so for the sake of a title, if I could title my message to you this morning, it would be... Should have gone to spec savers. <laughs> so anyway, Al goes off to the spec saver people and they test his eyes and do all that has to be done and he gets his new glasses. And um, last time he took Chloe with him to um, choose a pair so that he didn't look nerdy and like an old man, quote unquote, this time he went on his own. So I've got to be honest with you, Chloe and I were thinking... Oh, it could get interesting. What, Dad, what did you pick? Chloe saying, like, what colour did you pick, Dad? And what shape was it? And did it look like this? And I was like, I just picked a pair of glasses, Chloe. Anyway, he brought them home and he put them on and he kept saying to me, you know what, I, I can't see properly out of these glasses. They're, just, they're not working. And yet, by all accounts, they were like this. They got two arms, got a frame, got lenses, but he couldn't see out of them. So he went back to the optometrist, right? And the optometrist tested his glasses. And the reality was that they'd put the wrong lenses in. These glasses that he now had were 10 times more magnified than what he actually required. (laughs) So you can appreciate it distorted his view. His vision was a little bit funky for a couple of days. You know, there's a beautiful passage in the scriptures and I'll just Dave's going to put it up for me now. It's out of the Bible verse, Jeremiah 23, verse 29. And I'm just going to put mine on so that I can see properly. Oh. It says this, Does not my word burn like fire, says the Lord? Is it not like a mighty hammer that smashes a rock to pieces? Does not my word burn like a fire, says the Lord? Is it not like a mighty hammer that smashes a rock to pieces? You know, I was reading that passage and I thought, what do you think a rock, a rock with a little r, symbolises? And so I thought in our modern world, let's, let's think about a couple of things it may symbolise. I thought it may symbolise demonic oppression. It may symbolise a, mental, a medical or a mental diagnosis. It may symbolise lack. It may symbolise a stronghold. It's just something that keeps you from going forward. It may symbolise disappointment, distraction. Whatever it is for you, a rock can symbolise so many things, but at the end of the day, it's something that holds us back from living the abundant, full life that Jesus created us to live. The The Bible says here that the Word of God... 
this beautiful book. These pages contain people of power that I honestly believe as, as followers of Christ we do not tap into often enough. It is strong enough that it can shatter and destroy those rocks, those things that hold us back and that keep us from living the fulfill, fulfilling life that Christ intended us to. Amen? So let me ask you a question. Don't answer me out loud, but think about it. How much time do you spend in the book, in these beautiful pages where you would be encouraged to encounter Jesus throughout? You know, the one thing that I've learned in my Christian experience is that the Word of God is steadfast. It has the power to steady my world when everything else outside of that is going a little crazy. It helps bring into um, f- my gaze into focus. When things are sketchy, when things are stressful, when my focus is grey and loomy, the Word of God is the only thing that I have found that just steadies the path. It brings perspective. The Word of God is not moved. Amen? Amen. The word of God is not moved. It's not shattered by an awful diagnosis. You can walk out of that doctor's surgery and I'll tell you what, the truth that is within these pages remains the same. You can have a relationship breakdown, a friendship situation. The truth in the word of God is not shaken by that. You know, you can get a, have a certain political party take power in your nation. You can even have a pandemic. And you know what? The truths in the word of God are not shattered, they're not moved, they're not altered, they are unwavering. It is steadfast. I looked up that word this week in the Oxford Dictionary and here's what it said. Steadfast means to resolutely, it is resolutely, am I saying that right teachers? Resolutely? Resolutely firm and unwavering. It's committed. It's dependable. It's unyielding. It's uncompromising. And it's trusty. Doesn't that sound like something that you should frame your world and your focus on? It's uncompromising and trusty. Again, I believe more often than not, we do not tap into the power that lies within these pages. The word of God is the only steadfast truth currently in a world where, how many of you know, culture is rapidly changing? Unless you were living within your four walls, nine, uh, seven days a week, 24 hours a day, you would have to admit that culture is changing and changing rapidly. Those of you who are more mature in our congregation, would you have ever thought that you would see and hear things that are unfolding on a daily, weekly, monthly basis right now in our culture? Generations are turning on each other. You would never have once before heard a youthful person speak to an older person the way that we do in the streets that we live in today. You would never have heard that once before. There was respect. There was honour. There was manners, the M word. Generations are turning on each other. Gender and sexuality are not only impacting our cultures and communities, but tragically they're dividing the church. We're seeing denominations that have held fixed for centuries, dividing over this issue of gender and sexuality. If ever there was a time that we needed to have steadfastness, it's now. And you know that steadfastness can only come from one place. No political party, no organisation, no media outlet, only the word of God. You know, recently I've been um, going back reading over the Gospels And, you know, I find them just such a great place to ground myself in my Christian walk. And one of the things that never ceases to amaze me, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, they all talk about it. When Jesus walked and he was seeking his disciples, you know, he called them out and they acted immediately. It says in Matthew 4, verse 18 to 20, Jesus called the brothers Simon and Peter and the Bible says they left their nets at once. And followed him. They were fishermen, it's what they did. They could have been administrators, they could have been receptionists, they could have been hairdressers, they could have been doctors. But they were fishermen, that that was their place of employment. They left that immediately and followed him. Mark 1 17 18 says, Andrew left his nets at once and followed him. You know, I find that amazing. How many of you find that challenging when God calls on you to act immediately, without question? I mean, these guys left family. They didn't go back and say goodbye to Ma and Pa or get the inheritance or sort out the will. They just dropped everything and left immediately. You know, they, they had an awareness that a Messiah was to come. 
right through the Old Testament, from Genesis right the way through. There was prophecy after prophecy that a Messiah would come, that a leader would come and liberate the nation of Israel. You know what it did for them because of that? Because they were in the scriptures, because they knew it back to front, it created a worldview. It framed their world so that when they looked out there was clarity their lenses were clear on what life should look like now did the disciples have it all together no we read on when they travel with Jesus that they struggled like all of us they had issues they had um, limps in life I guess you could say but they were waiting for the Messiah so that when he came, it, was by, it wasn't a shock, it wasn't a surprise. They didn't sort of go back and ask, Dad, is this the real deal? You know what? They acted immediately. They were grounded enough in the Scriptures to recognise truth when it stood in front of them. The Scriptures had shaped them where they were looking and waiting. Are we looking and waiting today for when truth presents? Are we solid to know that when it does present, we know that we know that we know and we can obey it because we know it confidently to be what it is? You could say they wore lenses whereby they recognised something about Jesus when he called them. But it came, I believe, because they were grounded in the scriptures. They'd read, they'd had it taught. They talked about it as they were growing up in their families, right from Genesis, that a Messiah was coming, that a leader would come and rescue their nation. I'm very wary that we have teachers in our congregation, so you just love on me today. This, I'm just going to be honest here, right? Uh, recently, we had the opportunity to go to parent-teacher interviews for Chloe, and um, Al and I booked our appointments, and I was really strategic about it, you know? I, did the first, I had four teachers that I needed to see, or I wanted to see. And I made sure that the one that I booked last was the one that I just, I just had questions. You know, I know, I know. Now, Al was with me, all was well. And so, I, I just, not, not negative at all, but I just needed clarity. I felt like I'd looked at a particular subject that Chloe was doing at school and I didn't understand. I didn't get how, why it was unfolding the way it was. I didn't understand why they seemed to uh, be heading in a certain direction and not in another direction and exams were looming and la, la, la. And it, and it, it kind of, if I'm honest, I was feeling a little bit frustrated because I like things to be, you know, and it wasn't or it appeared that it wasn't. And so we rock into our parent-teacher interview and, you know, it's my favourite place at the school because it's so social. Like there's so many people there and I can get distracted as to why I'm there because there's people I haven't seen in a little while. And so Alan's kind of pulling me across and keeping me on track and keeping me focused and we sit down at the desk and, um, you know, we begin the interview with this particular teacher and I just asked her, Would you, do you mind if I just ask you one question? And she was beautiful and no, no problem. And so I asked my question and, you know, she began to expand on actually more than I probably deserved, to be perfectly honest. She explained to me why she did things a certain way, why she didn't do other things a certain way, why she went this path and not that path, why she ended up here and not there. And actually she was really open and quite humble and honest with us, I felt. And I, even as she began to talk, clarity began to fall and I actually understood the, the subject, I guess, not, not just a little bit clearer, but I understood why we had landed at where we had landed. To my surprise, when the whole picture was painted, when the, sp the, when the teacher spoke truth to me, it changed my reality. It changed my perspective. My focus became a lot clearer. She, she created a framework by which she functions in the classroom and that, for me, helped me understand the why and it answered the question of why. But it gave me such clarity. And I just thought, you know, how, how often do we go through circumstances where we have this much of the picture and we form a truth and we form a reality and we go gun ho with that. But in actual fact, we need the whole picture in order to establish a truth. There's only one source, people, that create, has the whole picture. The Word of God is the only right perspective on life. When you know it, when you're in it, you, find, you will find it grounds you despite whatever's going on, despite what we're being told, despite the messages that are screamed out at us, it gives you perspective. As you all know, Alan and I um, went on holidays uh, recently 
And like everyone does on holidays, life slows down enough for you to actually um, enjoy and to think and to process and to do things that you probably wouldn't normally do. And with my work, I often do the early shift. And so I'm out the door before the family is awake. And so I try to be really quiet and I don't put um, TVs or radios or anything on. And so we had landed at Mudgee, I think it was. Alan was still in bed and so I'm up and about and I thought, I'm just going to flick on the TV and um, listen to one of those morning show things. And it was really interesting. I I don't get to listen to them and so it was quite interesting to hear them doing their thing and they shared a story. And in the midst of the story, this report, the reporter crossed over to, I think he was the head of the New South Wales Ambulance Department. And he begins to share this story on how um, the phone lines, the triple O phone line, had become really clogged in the state. And they were putting an appeal out for people to, you know, only call when it's an emergency. And so they listed a couple of those. Obviously, there was heart issues and those kinds of situations. But he was saying, you know, we're getting calls from anything at the moment, from a headache to a toothache to constipation. He said, they're ringing triple O and we're wasting our resources and our time going to these things that were minor medical conditions, but they're calling out the emergency services. And I thought, you know, isn't it interesting For three years, right, three years, we've had our medical um, experts, and I say that respectfully, our media platforms and our government, and I will say I think our government did a fantastic job, so I'm not banging on anyone, but I'm just stating a fact that for almost three years, we were presented with a narrative. If you've got a headache or you've got a sniffle, it's highly likely you're going to end up in high ICU. And you know what? If you're one of the unfortunate ones, you're probably actually going to die because it's more than likely going to be COVID. And I'm taking the liberty, I guess, to exaggerate a little bit, but you understand what I'm saying. The reality is you couldn't turn on anything, you couldn't hear anything, you couldn't read anything without a negative report that every symptom, all of a sudden, every other sickness on the planet left and there was only COVID. And any symptom you had could not possibly have been anything else, but it was COVID. And if it was COVID, you needed to go to emergency straight away. You were going to end up in ICU and or maybe worse. And I'm not underplaying that there were genuine situations where people experienced um, extreme situations. But my point just being... When you are listening to a narrative and you are believing a narrative and you're not putting anything else in on the inside of you, it's exactly what Alan said this morning. That's what you begin to put your faith in. And so we had a state, and I'm sure it's actually a nation, but they were only speaking about New South Wales. We have a state that is so fear, uh, fear, fear, fear focused that anything from a slight toothache, I've got to call Triple O because I need to go to emergency, or I've got a headache, I need to go to emergency. How many of you remember the day back in the deep, dark, distant past when if you had a headache, you could actually just take a Panadol and rest and lo and behold, you were going to be okay. Do you remember those days? Don't they feel like a lifetime ago? We're so conditioned to believe something completely different today. I don't know where you are today. I don't know what your situations are. I know some of you and I know some of your stories. And I just know our story, that we too, like everybody else, have our seasons where we've got it all going on. You know, there's a beautiful story, and I want to close with this. There's a beautiful story in the Old Testament. You might have heard of it. Where three great young men who framed their entire world around the reality of God... Their names were Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego. Heard of them? Remember the story? What a great story for us today. What a great story to draw from their resilience and their faith. But more than that, it took discipline for them to get to the place they were that day in the furnace. It took discipline of even when you're busy, even when you can't be bothered. And you know what? Even when you're struggling to think that it actually works of getting into these pages, encountering Jesus, uh, learning and embracing the way that he calls us to walk. Their entire worlds were framed. They weren't missing an arm where their vision was out of focus. 
Their lenses weren't 10 times magnified beyond so they couldn't see clearly. Their entire worlds were framed around the reality of God. But you know what? That even if it cost them, even if he did not come through and rescue them, they would not bow to any other God. They would not bow to worship any other God. They were not going to change the lenses that they'd literally placed around their world for their entire existence. They would not bow. But even if he didn't, even if he hasn't answered you the way you had hoped or wanted or wished or prayed for, even if he hasn't come through for you yet, these guys were not going to bow to any other God. So what about you? What's God speaking to you about? Is God speaking to you at the moment? What are you using to frame your world around? What are you using to raise your children, those of you with young families? doesn't matter if it looks like working. We have children. You know what? We have children who are right now not walking in the ways of God. Does it change how you raise them? Does it change what you base your family on? What are you framing your world around? What lenses are you looking through? What diagnosis do you have that you're believing God to come through, but he hasn't yet? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. But God, even if you don't, we will not bow to any other God. Let me pray. Father, we are just blown away, God, by the simplicity of the Christian faith, yet the complexity that's there at the same time. God, we, at times, I believe, confuse the journey that you intended it to be. Lord, that if we just simply love you with all of our heart, with all of our mind, with all of our soul, with all of our strength, and we love the ones that are sitting and living beside us, then, God, all is well. Father, I pray for every person in this building this morning, God, every person online, Lord, that they'd feel the drawing of your presence this week, drawing them into these beautiful pages, your word, God, your truth, your frame, Father, by which there's protection, there's grace, there's safety, there's provision, Father, there's answers. God, I pray that you would... Draw each one of us this week, Father, into your word. And Lord, I pray that for those of us, Father, that find this book confusing or difficult to understand, God, that you would grant to each one of us the gift of understanding. Lord, that as we read those pages, Father, that there would be truths that would just jump out, jump out to us. Father, I pray for every prayer that's in the heart of every person in this room, God, that, Lord, your word would come to them. Father, your direction, God, that you would help each person realign their focus. Lord, that they'd realign what they're looking at and looking for. And Father, we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Sorry, I'm used to Al doing this. <laughs> you know, church, honestly, I... Um, I honestly believe, truly, that we are living in days where unless we are centred on Christ and on his word, we will stumble. You know, the Bible talks about even the elect in the end times, even the elect will stumble. I mean, I don't know about you, but that freaks the life out of me because I'm very confident of this one thing. I'm not one of the elect and I'm not one of the academic ones that get it. And so even if God says that even they may stumble, then how much more? How much more? And we are living in times, you know, the saddest thing I think is when you hear that denominations are dividing over issues within our culture. There's only one thing. There's only one thing that centres us. There's only one thing that will keep us grounded, keep us in a place of truth, and that is his beautiful word. Amen. So let me encourage you this week, put aside the busyness, put aside the family, put the kids in front of the TV. Do you know what? If they're going to watch one screen during the week, let it be while you're in the word of God. Amen. Parents, amen. And grandparents. And you know what? Just get into these pages and find him. Find him. That's where the answers are. That's where grace lies. That's where peace lies. But most importantly, that is where truth is found. Amen.